Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night here at Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. Okay, let's talk announcements. Um, of course, this coming up weekend, we have the Easter weekend. So on Friday, we have the Good Friday service from noon to one. And then afterwards, we, those of you who can stay and volunteer, we will be transforming the sanctuary into a diner. I don't know what to call it. But anyways, we'll set all the tables up, get it ready to serve breakfast on Saturday morning. So at Saturday morning at 9, um, we'll have the community breakfast. And at 10, we will have all the kids events. So we kind of change things up. So we are 55 foot jumper obstacle course will be right over here. We're putting it inside because of the weather. So we're going to have an inside the jumper inside the treasure hunt will be all inside. So it's it's going to be a madhouse in here. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. So all of it will be in here. Just we made that decision because the weather's just not not looking like it's going to cooperate and I don't really want to be any playing in the jump house in 40 degree weather in the rain. So we moved it in here. No, but it will be in here. So we'll have the breakfast and then we'll move the sanctuary around so that we can get the jumper in here. And then Cheryl and Corey will do places throughout the church creatively for the treasure hunt. I don't know how all that's going to work yet, but we'll see. But so we're excited about that. And then after all of those events are over on Saturday, then those of you who can volunteer, what we'll do is we'll clean the church back up and then put the sanctuary back together, getting it ready for Sunday morning. And then, of course, we'll have the Sunday service at 10 a.m. So we're going to try to get everything done so that all we have to focus on Sunday is, is the service. And then, uh, yes, sir. Have they changed the broadcast time to 10 o'clock? Yeah. Yeah, it's been changed at 10 o'clock and it will remain, we'll just continue on that schedule afterwards, one service from here on out at 10 o'clock that will be broadcast, all that kind of stuff. So we're excited about that. And then let's see what else do we got going on. We have coming up on the 24th after the service, Pastor Aaron is going to have a uh, meeting for the greeters or those who would like to be a greeter, probably in room four or I don't know, somewhere. We'll, we'll let you know on the 24th. But. And then on the 30th, Saturday the 30th, there's going to be a family hike up Lower Table Rock. So anybody who would like to go, you can meet here at the church at 9 a.m. And uh, like I said, you can, Ed, wherever he's at right here, he can give you more information about it. Uh, the only way I'm going is if Ed packs me up to the top. <laughs> so, well, the helicopter, apparently it's not in our church budget. <laughs> what kind of church is this? I mean, <laughs> poor. <laughs> oh, I love the interaction. <laughs> All right, and then lastly, um, what we're going to do is then on May 1st, um, that night for evening service, is the leadership, pastors, elders, all of that, we're going to host a Q&A. Um, yeah, so we, we, it was one of those things where uh, when we started transitioning, one of the things that I said is we're going to be as transparent of, of the process as much as we possibly can. And so we just feel like it's time to have just a Q&A for anybody who has any questions or, or whatever that we can possibly answer. So we're going to have as all of the pastors and elders that are in town um, here that night just to be here. It'll just be an informal kind of thing, um, you know, where we just answer any questions we can. And if that goes well and it seems like... Um, you know, it's something that the church body wants, then we'll try to do that on a semi-regular basis. So, depending on how all the hard questions are. You don't want them hard questions? No, I get the easy questions. 
Pastor Aaron gets all the hard questions. Yeah, we'll just work it that way. So, no. Uh, but no, it, it's just a good time to be able to, you know, I've tried going around the, some of the groups, the men's group, the women's group, et cetera, just to be available to answer questions. And this would just be in one spot where everybody could ask questions. So we just thought it would be a good idea. So, and I think that's about it for announcements. So if the worship team wants to make their way up here, we'll pray for service and worship the Lord together. Lord, we come before you, and as always, we are so grateful that you allow us the awesome privilege of worshiping you here in this place um, with family. And so, Lord, I just pray that you'd anoint the worship team now, Lord, and God, that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. So, Lord, we give you this time now, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know what's awesome right now, when you kind of reflect back? We're right in the middle of Passion Week. When Christ was walking the earth, that last week of his life, Sunday started Palm Sunday. And then, of course, you know Friday, when they um, tried him illegally and crucified him, he gave his life willingly. And then Sunday our glorious victory, his resurrection, because his sacrifice was sufficient for our sin. But this is right in the middle of that Passion Week, right in the very middle of that Passion Week. So if you can, let's stand and worship our Lord and Savior in song.
for all that you do in our lives. We are so, so thankful, Lord, for your love, for your wonderful mercy and grace. And Lord God, that every morning it is brand new. And every evening it never runs out. It never runs out. You are sufficient in our lives. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated if you like.
Christ alone My hope is found He is my light, my strength My song, this cornerstone This solid ground Burned through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when thriving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone, who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless pain This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones He came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on Him was laid Here in the death of Christ I lived. Here in the ground His body lay Light of the world in darkness stain In bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curse has lost its grip on me With the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life, no fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny
wounds which my love's chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until. How special we are, how special we are that he would shed his blood for you, that he would give his life for you and for me, for each of us. How special we are. Did you know you are God's masterpiece? You are God's masterpiece. You are God's joy. Think of that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.
You reached out to us before we even knew anything about you. You knocked upon the door of our hearts. You knocked, and you knocked, and you were there. Thank you, Jesus, for calling each of us by name, for calling us out of the darkness and into the light, into the everlasting light. And thank you that your love for us is sufficient. It is more than enough. And oh, Father, we just, we, we love you. And we praise you. 
we thank you for the gifts that you give to us, for our life everlasting and the day, Lord God. Each day we get to know you more. Each day you draw us nearer to you. And one day, one day, it'll be face to face. Oh, Lord, what a glorious day. Oh, glorious day when you call us home. So, Father God, we ask that you bless Pastor Kevin and the message he gives through your word. And bless this family. In your holy name we pray. Amen. If you would like, say hi to people. So this week we're going to be in Psalms 2, obviously. And in Psalms 2, it's kind of interesting. It has many applications um, that we'll take a look at. One of them being it shows the path of rebellion and its consequences. You know, because there is always consequences for our rebellion, isn't there? Any time that we choose to rebel against God, uh, you know, there's consequences. And one of the other aspects of this, this psalm is that it's a messianic psalm. And we'll see uh, both really the first coming and the second coming in this, in this psalm. So this one's rich. It has, uh, there's a lot to it. So why don't we uh, go ahead and read it. We'll pray and, and then get started. And I'm looking forward to praise reports to hear what God has done in your lives in the last week. Wants it to done. So Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them uh, to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all of those who put their trust in him. Amen. Amen. Lord, we, as we open up your word and we look at Psalm 2, Lord, I pray that uh, you would just give us wisdom and an understanding of all that's here, Lord. God, I pray that you would anoint me with your words to speak tonight. So God, uh, we just thank you and praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, it's kind of interesting, last week, obviously we looked at Psalm 1, and this week as we look at Psalm 2, there, there was a time when these were actually all one psalm. I, I'm not sure of when they were split apart, but at some point they, they were separated in the two psalms. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting Commentator Warren Wiersbe, he said, Psalms 1 emphasizes God's law, while Psalm 2 focuses on prophecy. The people in Psalm 1 delight in the law, but the people in Psalm 2 defy the law. Psalm 1 begins with, be with a beatitude, and Psalm 2 ends with a beatitude. Psalm 1 is never quoted in the New Testament while well, Psalm 2 was quoted or alluded to at least 18 times, more than any single psalm. So, you know, it's just kind of interesting, the psalm, and we'll see, you know, although here in, in Psalm 2 itself, it doesn't give us who the author is, but uh, 
It's uh, in the New Testament in Acts chapter 4, it's alluded that uh, David wrote this psalm. And we'll look at that here a little bit later. But, um, you know, it's a very interesting psalm in the sense that, uh, you know, like I said, it, it had both a um, it has both a prophetic meaning to it, but it will also probably applied to King Solomon, that David wrote it about King Solomon too. So it had a, you know, a, a, a current application, or, and it also had a, a future, a prophetic application to it, which is pretty neat. You know, it's, uh, like I said, it, uh, more than likely, David wrote that, well, not more than likely, David did write it according to Acts chapter 4. And um, as we go through it and as we read about it, you know, it, and it, just look at the first verse. It says, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? You know, think about the where we live right now and the circumstances we live in. You know, uh, how much more could it be said about the time that we live in? You know, why do the nations rage? You know, just look at Russia, Ukraine, all the things that we've experienced in the last, you know, uh, 20 years, ISIS and all these things, you know, the, uh, the how these nations rage and they plot a vain thing, you know, because anything that is not of God, anything that's not, uh, you know, in God's will is a vain thing, isn't it? We can chase after whatever it is we want, but if it's not of God, it's a vain thing. And whenever we start chasing out of anything that's outside of God's will, it becomes vainer and vainer. I don't even know if vainer is a word, but you know what I'm saying. It becomes more vain and more vain all the time. My wife back there with her, uh, her master's in education is probably going, he's doing it again. But... I like Vayner, so it, you become more Vayner and Vayner all the time. And, you know, and it doesn't stop because it, it's one of those things not only do we see in our culture or in the world we live in, but we've all probably experienced in our own life that the farther we get away from God, the more ungodly we get, right? It makes sense. And the more we start rationalizing these things and the more... Uh, vain we become. And, and it's just this downward cycle. And we see it, uh, you know, to the point where we're talking about here, you know, where, where they're plotting vain things against God. And as we read this, you know, in verse four, God laughs like, and it's the only place in scripture that it says God laughs, but he's not laughing like, oh, that was a cute joke. He's laughing like, you're all a bunch of idiots. <laughs> Right. You know, it's one of those kind of things. And but that's how we can get uh, the farther we get away from God, isn't it? The more vain we become, the more that it, we become ridiculous, really, uh, in the sight of God. And, and, you know, where we can go from where we're serving the Lord. And I've seen it. You've all seen it to this place where, you know, you're not even recognizable in the sense because your sin uh, has blinded you to so much. And it's unfortunate. And then someday, hopefully, you wake up and go, how did I get here? And that's kind of what, what's going on here in these verses. You know, it says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, you know, it says they take counsel together. They're not seeking godly counsel, obviously, are they? They're giving each other counsel. And, you know, um, there's a word there for us in just a practical sense. When we start taking counsel from the world or from ungodly sources, once again, it leads back to that vainness, doesn't it? I don't even know if that's a word either. I'm making all kinds of new words with vain. But, you know, uh, it, it just leads to more, uh, becoming more and more vain, doesn't it? Because that's the wisdom of the world. That's not godly wisdom. In fact, as it's saying here, it says, against the Lord and against his anointed. That, that word anointed, it's talking about the Messiah, you know? And, and so how could you possibly... The ridiculousness of, of, of what's being brought up here. You know, how could you possibly have counsel against God and the Messiah? What is there that we could possibly know that the Father 
and the Messiah, what could we possibly have that would be different than theirs as far as knowledge, right? Anything that goes against what we know to be true is biblically speaking is just vain. And yet it leads to such things that, you know, it, it's amazing, but it, that's what leads this kind of wisdom when we start electing leaders that are not godly. You know, that's why our country was so powerful early on or that we were so blessed, weren't we? Because part of public service, you had to be a Christian, you know? That's obviously not the case now, is it? You know, it almost goes against you if you are a Christian. But the point being is, you know, to be qualified for office back then, you had to be a Christian. Your wisdom had to come from the Lord, where it should come from. But now, you know, it's not so. We elect people in our schools. We elect people in, you know, national offices, whatever, that are against the Lord, you know, that try to take God out of our society. They, you know, try to take God out of the courtroom, you know, try to take God out of our schools and all these things. And, you know, unfortunately, we as a society and we as a church, have set idly by, really, and let it happen, you know, um, because we didn't speak up, you know, and so our kids are being taught all these things, and our, uh, and we wonder why uh, there's so much despair in our society. We wonder why there's such a high suicide rate amongst teenagers, etc. Well, when you don't give someone, uh, you know, the knowledge that there's hope when they don't understand that they can be connected to the God that will give them a hope, that will give them a future and a hope, what else is there? If this is all there is, then I can understand why you would get, you know, get, be dis in despair and fear and anxiety and all of those other things, because, man, if this is as good as it gets, it's not very good. What's the point? You know, I can see why some would get so despairing, but we know this is as bad as it gets, don't we? It doesn't get any worse than this. But we've got a future and a hope to look forward to that is out of this world, literally. And so as these verses go on, you know, like I said, um, in Acts chapter 4, and I'll just turn there real quick. You don't have to. I'll just read it. But in Acts chapter 4, in verses, what we'll begin in verse 24, we see these verses quoted, and it's a timely word for us because it's relating to the resurrection. And, you know, um, as we get ready to enter into uh, and celebrate the resurrection, in verse 24 of Acts 24, it says, So when they heard that they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are the God who made heaven and earth and the sea and, that all, and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, but Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. It says, Now, Lord, look at their hearts and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You know, I love this prayer of boldness that's going on. You know, um, it's saying regardless of who is going against Jesus, right? That's what it was saying. It was saying that Pontius Pilate, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, everybody was against Jesus. But regardless of that, regardless of all of those things, you know, it was you, God, who made the heaven and the earth, right? It was you who's in control and you're on the throne no matter what, uh, you know, the, uh, what the worldly wisdom says or no matter how much they come against godly wisdom, he's still on the throne. And it doesn't matter, does it? it? I don't care what they're trying to teach in the schools. I don't care what they say. I don't care how politically correct it is uh, and to say, nope, 
I believe in what the Bible says, you know, and when we do that, it's kind of funny because what we're called bigots or we're called, uh, you know, we're closed minded and we need to be more open. And are we really loving, you know, um, you know, everybody's got to choose their own path. And it's like, no, there's only one way. There's only one truth. And it's only through Christ. So actually, for us not to tell someone the truth who's being deceived uh, or living a vain life like it's talking about here, it's we hate them if we don't tell them the truth. It's love that we tell them the truth. And we need to tell them the truth in love, right? Uh, just as some of these, these nations that it's talking about here that's plotting against God, it's not going to go well for them either. Anybody who, who has read the book of Revelations know that, right? It's not going to go well for them, but yet what are we doing to spread the gospel? What are we doing to show them the light? Uh, you know, what are we doing as far as, uh, you know, uh, spreading the gospel? And that's what I love about the opportunity that we have coming up this week, is we have the opportunity to share that, don't we? We have the opportunity uh, to, to share the most important event to ever happen in human history. You know, when, when Christ defeated death, and rose again, you know? There's power in the empty grave, isn't there? Well, there's power in the fact that the grave is empty. I should be, would probably be a better way of saying it. And it's true because, you know what? We serve the one who created the heavens and the earth. We serve, we serve an all-powerful, almighty God that, um, you know, who loves us, who gave his life for us. And we're going to celebrate that here on Sunday. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. You know, I'm excited about the fact that the one thing that we do know is God's wisdom is true and it never goes out of date. So regardless of, of you know, as our culture and as the world changes and, and, you know, gets farther and farther away from the godly wisdom, we see God's response here in verses four through six, don't we? You know, and it, it says... In, in verse 4, it says, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. You know, like I said earlier, this is the only place in the Bible that it refers to God laughing. And it's not the laughing in the sense of, like I said, uh, of hilarity or whatever, but it's a laugh of der derision or mockery. It's like, come on, really? You know, it'd be, it's one of those kind of things where God... God's showing us the ridiculousness of it all. You know, God is not afraid of, you know, those who oppose him, right? Or, or all the armies that are going to be gathered against him. You know, it, it means nothing to him. You know, it's not like he's sitting there going, okay, let me see. I've got 4.8 million heavenly hosts over here. And there's, uh, let's see, 20 million armies there. You know, oh, we're in trouble, guys. No, you know, no, of course not. Um, God just kind of laughs about it. Then it, as it continues on in verse 5 and 6, it says, that, uh, Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. You know, God... God um, wants those who are in revolt against him, those who are in rebellion against him, to know that he appointed Jesus the, the supreme and sovereign king over all, doesn't he? And, you know, regardless of if you're for Christ or not, your knee's still going to bow to him. One way or another, every knee shall bow. And I don't know about you, but... Uh, <laughs> I would prefer to bow my knee now than a, at that end. So is it, you know, and it's interesting here because all of that wisdom and, and you know, in times past we've seen this where, where people either try to deny the existence of God or, or think about uh, Frederick Nitschke or however you say his name, who, there you go. I can't pronounce anything. So it says, God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. Now, if that doesn't sound like, uh, you know, vain wisdom, 
Um, it says, how shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe this blood off of us? What water is there for us to cleanse ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? You know, no, Frederick, you're dead, and God is very much alive. <laughs> In fact, he's conquered death and, and the grave so that we may live, hasn't he? You know, so no matter what that wisdom was, like I said, the farther we run from God, the more vain we get and the more ridiculous our logic becomes. Because the one thing that I know is true and clear is the next couple of verses is that um, Christ will reign. And in verses 7 through 9, it says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the end of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them the pieces with a potter's vessel. You know, I love this. It says, I will declare a decree. You know, he's been installed as the king of king and the Lord of lords, right? He's, um, it's one of those things where regardless of how much the nations rage against him, no matter how much they come against him, no matter how evil the, the day comes or the nations come or, you know, all of these governments that are, are you know, anti-Christianity, um, it doesn't matter. It's all, they're all plotting a vain thing, aren't they? Because ultimately, like I said, every knee's going to bow. It doesn't matter. And as in the second part of verse 7 there, it says, The Lord has said to me, You are my son, and today I have begotten you. You know, according to Acts 13.33, this is a reference to the resurrection, you know, where it says, was begotten from the tomb and raised in glory. See, every world religious leader, every religious leader there's ever been, you know, you can go to their grave, can't you? You can visit the bones of whoever it was. You can visit their bones. But when we go to our gods, it's an empty tomb. Because he rose from the dead. He defeated death, didn't he? Like I said, so that we can live. And that's the power of the resurrection, isn't it? He died and rose again so that we can live. And that's what we're going to be celebrating this weekend. And I, I don't know about you, but I can't wait for that. You know, um, as it continues on in, in the verse 8 and 9 there, it says, Ask of me and I will give to you the nations for your inheritance. And at the end of each of your, uh, at the ends of the earth for your possession, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces with a potter, like a potter's vessel. You know, um, Harry Ironside once wrote at a missionary conference. He said, "I never come to a missionary meeting, but I feel as though there ought to be written right across the entire platform: Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession." He continued, "It is the will of God that His Son should have a great heritage out of the heathen world, the godless Gentiles." You know, it's true. Uh, why don't we? Why are we not redeeming these countries um, based on this promise, right, that God's given? You know, they're all Christ anyway, so why don't we go, you know, why don't we take the message and redeem them? That's what it's saying there, and I love that thought. As it continues on in, in verse 10, it says, um, Now therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. You know, now that's good advice, isn't it? Serve the Lord with fear. It's not the same kind of fear that we think of, like, you know, when a semi truck's about to hit you or something type of fear, but it's that awe, that reverence, that, that fear in the sense that, um, you know, uh, yeah, you just have that reverence of it. I think of it like uh, with my dad, right, where, I knew I had a certain kind of respectful fear in the sense that if I got out of line, he was going to put me back in line, 
right? There was a love, but there was also a knowledge of knowing that. You know, it's kind of one of those things that uh, as we fear God, uh, as we have that fear, it's important that we understand, you know, then it goes on to say, and rejoice with trembling, kiss the son lest he be angry. You know, we have one of those things where in these verses, it's important to note that, uh, you know, Really, the Lord here gives us five ways that we can repent from our rebellion, from losing our way. And it says, first of all, in these last verses, it says, Now, therefore, O kings, um, be wise. The first thing is to be wise. You know, to know um, and to realize that we are, in fact, rebellion. And that takes... That takes us being intimate in God's word, isn't it? It makes us, we need to have knowledge of God's word because like I said, if we don't get our wisdom from here, we're gonna get it from somewhere. And when we get it from anywhere other than here, it's not really wisdom, is it? It says, be wise. Then the second part says, be instructed, or in other words, be warned. As we become wise in God's word, we become instructed or we become warned, aren't we? We know what God would have us do and what God would have us not to do, don't we? We understand, we grow closer to his heart. The more that we're in his word, the more his word gets into us. And then, that's, then it goes on to say, serve, the third part is serve the Lord with fear. The fourth part is rejoice with trembling. You know, we should rejoice in our relationship with the Lord. We should rejoice in the fact that we serve, uh, you know, an all-loving, all-powerful, mighty God that loves us enough that he went, sent his son to the cross, right? You know, we should be rejoicing with trembling. And it says, kiss the son is the last part. You know, um, it's kind of that picture of, of uh, you know, when they would kiss a, a king's ring or whatever, they'd bow and kiss a, a king's ring, you know, that, that we subject ourselves to, we're servants to the Most High God, right? We should have that kind of relationship. So when we're truly serving the Lord, when we're doing these things, then we can have that kind of relationship. And then I love the way it ends. It says, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Once again, as we, in Psalm 1, it said, it says, blessed is the man who walks in the counsel, um, in the counsel of the, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, right? And then here it says, blessed are those who put their trust in God. So when we're not taking the world's wisdom, but we're getting our wisdom from God, and when we're truly, um, you know, putting our trust in Him, then we're going to be blessed, aren't we? One, we're going to be wise in a godly sense. And if we put our trust in God, if our trust is in God, then what do we got to worry about? If we put our trust in God, then our focus is where it's going to need to be, isn't it? We're not going to put, our eyes aren't going to be on all of those things that, um, you know, that the world worries about or that produces the fear or the, you know, the despair or whatever it is, because we're not focused on this. This is in our home anyways. You know, we're just traveling through here. Our home, yeah, exactly. We're sojourners. Our home's in heaven. So why would we be, why do we get caught up in the affairs of what's going on in this world? We don't need to be. Because it's all going to burn up anyways. So why get too attached to it? You know, it's, it's just one of those things, you know. As, so as we kind of went through this and, and talked a little bit about you know, rebellion, you know, we need to make sure that instead of rebelling, we take our refuge in Christ, isn't it? You know, instead of running away from the Lord, we need to be running to the cross, you know, because you're going to do one or the other. You're either going to run on your own path and you're going to run away, or you're going to run to the cross. And I guarantee you, um, you're going to be blessed running to the cross, right? But rebellion, God takes serious. You know, Jesus is the only refuge that we have. Jesus is the only refuge that will protect us from, uh, you know, perishing first and foremost, spending eternity in hell, right? Um, we can turn to Jesus. 
He's our refuge and our strength. We have nothing to worry about because He's overcome the world. He's overcome death. Amen? Amen. Well, with that being said, um, you know, we're going to transition into some praise reports and, and uh, um, really just what God's doing in and through this church. And, and I'll start. Uh, I know, and I kind of gave a praise report last week, but um, my friend that was on life support, um, I said was on life support, you know, he, he went without oxygen for 18 minutes. And he was completely, they thought he was completely brain dead. In fact, he was in such bad shape that they couldn't even do an MRI because they felt moving him to do the MRI would kill him because his heart was producing so little. Well, we went up there um, Saturday, I think it was. These days just kind of blur together anymore. Um, but we went up there, and he's up walking around. He's talking. So I went in there. Yeah, it's just. So going from brain dead to, you know, his brain starting to connect, it was a little wild conversations, I'll tell you that. And it was, none of it really made sense, but the fact that he was up walking and doing things one minute, um, it was kind of funny, you know, um, they bring him grape juice, so he thinks he's got an alcoholic drink, and he's telling me, which club are we going to? <laughs> Whichever one you want. I don't know, what, are, what do you say? You know, and he was like, well, just give me the address, because I know everybody. I was like, okay, and so I kind of look on my phone and just gave an address to something, and he was like, oh, okay, let's go. I was like, okay. You know, and, and then um, we... St- we start talking about football and he's talking about all these plays and then he'd randomly talk about something else. So his brain was starting to fire, but it's still, you know, a little confused. And then at the end, when I was done with the visit, I go to get up and he's like, okay, we're going now. And I was like, you know, cause this guy's like about this tall. And uh, uh, the fact that he could even get up and walk and all of that kind of stuff, but he was going with me and nobody was stopping him. And, and it was cute because there was his, he has a full, full-time like nurse or whatever. And she was about this tall. <laughs> and he's literally about this tall. And so he gets up and he's walking out with me and she's like grabbed around him and, you know, <laughs> And, and, you know, he's still out of it enough that he, not a lot of common sense yet. And he was just going, so he was just kind of walking with her. And I'm like, stop, stop. And then finally, kind of got him pushed back on the bed. And he was like, did you see that? She pushed me. And I'm like, she's this tall. But, but no, it was, it was awesome to see how much God, how many miracles God's already performed. And, uh, <laughs> and then... He's still got a ways to go. Don't, don't get me wrong. You know, at the end, I like, he's standing up and we're trying to get him down. I was like, all right, I'm going to pray for you. And he goes, I can't use the exact words because they were cuss words, but he, I said, I'm going to pray for you. And he was like, no. And I was like, okay, I'll pray for you anyways, but just not with you because he was starting to get, but it was really neat to see, um, how far God's done it in the whole family. It just describes it to, you know, to the prayers, the thousands of prayers that he's receiving um, throughout the country. And man, God has shown himself mighty because like I said, when I first saw him the day that he went in the cardiac arrest, he just wasn't there. Uh, you know, uh, his kidneys were gone. His brain was gone. His heart was gone. And I didn't know, I didn't think he was really going to make it through the night. But once again, but God had other plans. But God, yeah, amen. So, see? Even, even the dog knows. So, so no, God is good. But uh, So if there's anybody who would like to share a praise report or anything they would like prayed for, the mic's open. We need the Jeopardy music. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, Wendy's coming up for one. <laughs> Hello. I had an awesome praise report. Sam, my brother in law, is home from the hospital. He came home Monday. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you, Lord. Um, he has his prostate is a little bit enlarged, but they checked and there is no cancer. 
Yeah, I know. Um, they gave him IV antibiotics. They had to do a culture to see what antibiotics his body would respond to, and they found what would work, and then they sent him home. So he's doing really good. So thank you for your prayers. Okay, start praying now, please. Hurry. Let's pray. <laughs> And he's got a Bible in his hand. I'm showing you something. Uh -huh. Okay, no. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> hi, Pastor. Okay, so God has put it on my heart, the scripture, which I know where it is now. It's, it's in this book, and it's in Genesis 2050. And it says, what the devil intended for bad. I shared this last week, but I just, I just knew it was in here. But now I know where it is. <laughs> It's in 2050, what the devil intended for bad, the good Lord can change into good. And that means something that happens at church, at home, with this ministry. This is crazy ministry, you turn for Christ. People talk crap about us all the time. We're a cult, we're this thing and that thing and this thing. You're in church, watch your mouth. Oh, sorry. I dug a hole last time. Okay, I see miracles over there. I see miracles sitting over here, even though we mess up a lot. I see miracles right here. I'm just saying what the devil intended for bad, the good Lord could turn into good. And I see good everywhere here. The love of this church, the love of, they, they teach out of this. I love that the most. They go uh, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's what we do. And some of it's hard hitting. And it ain't nice to hear, but it's the truth. Amen. Love you guys. That's a, that's a pew Bible. Um, that's not allowed to be taken home. Uh, or, or used for demonstration. <laughs> no, seriously. You know, I just want to give a praise report because, you know, we've been through a lot. And um, my wife's mom is not doing well. She fell and she broke her, her wrist and she's got a... Um, some other health issues, but every single time my wife calls down there, all they talk about is the Lord. And even seven years ago, you know, she was like, I can't talk to her about the Lord because I'm, I'm, I would have to talk to her about where I'm going to church and, and she's, I know she's going to say something. And now it's like, She's like, yeah, I, I go to Calvary, and, and, but she always talks about the Bible, and that's the main, the key. You know, her, her mom can't refute the Bible and God's Word. So every single time she gets off, the, gets off the phone, it used to be with tears, and now it's with joy. So, mm -hmm. so that's a, just a praise report. And that's the way it should be in our lives. I mean, no matter what's going on, we should end it with joy because we have hope in Christ. So like uh, what Pastor Jerry was saying, that this is the middle of the week of that Savior's final week. Um, it's not resurrection yet. Not yet, but it is. Okay. No, just, just kidding. Um, so, you know, we're looking forward to this weekend. We're really praying for this weekend because there are a lot of people that um, we have been praying in our neighborhood, in our neighborhood around the church, in all of your guys' neighborhood. And we're just really praying that people who have never really heard the gospel will come out and hear it, the true gospel, and they will actually give their lives to a saving knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done for them. So keep praying. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up this weekend to you. We thank you for what you've done on the cross for us. We thank you, Father, for sending your son. And now, Lord, we, just like this psalm says, we kiss the son and we thank you. We, we, do, we do not kiss the son with a Judas kiss, but with a holy, righteous, thankful kiss because of who you are and what you've done on our behalf. So we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I will close us in prayer then. Lord, we thank you for this night. God, I just uh, uh, praise you for all that you're doing in and through this church, Lord. God, we ask that, um, as Pastor Aaron said, that uh, all of the busyness uh, 
of this weekend, Lord, and all the preparations and all of that, that uh, through it all, we would keep our eyes focused on you, God. And um, Lord, that we would be able to just minister to the lost, to those who don't know yet the power of the resurrection, the power of living a life in the power of the resurrection. And so, Lord, we ask for many divine opportunities this weekend, Lord. Uh, give us your heart for the lost. Lord, give us your heart to serve one another. And God, we just thank you for uh, all that you're doing in and through this church. Lord, we, we thank you that you are a God who truly sees and, and cares for us, Lord. You know, that you cared enough that you came down to this, to this puny little planet, Lord, and that uh, you died on the cross and uh, bared the, uh, the penalty of our sins. But then you rose again, Lord. And God, as we celebrate that this weekend, God, I pray that you would never let us uh, lose sight of what that truly means to us. So, go, Lord, I just thank you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's end in some worship. You know, before we step into this worship song, it's from um, several different psalms. One of them is from Psalm 40. But there was a verse, a verse that touched my heart this morning. It's in Matthew, and he says, Jesus says, and this is what he says to us, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How hard is it to keep the law? <laughs> How difficult is it to keep the law, to carry that burden? And he says, come to me and you will find rest for your souls. You will find true rest. I can't have any peace until I have my rest in him. And when we have rest and peace, you know what follows is joy. Wonderful, wonderful joy. And it's that joy in our hearts that the world longs to see. They want to know. How come you're so joyful? Why are you joyful? Amen, Michael. Amen. Why are you joyful? It is Jesus. He loves me. And he, he died for all of my sin. Everything, everything he took upon his shoulders. And not just mine, but the entire world's. So that anyone can come to him. Anybody can come to him. Rich, poor, doesn't matter. Come to me, all, all who labor. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Oh, Father, help us to always keep our eyes on you. Help us to always watch your step, and then we'll step with you. Help us, Lord. Keep us so close that we are literally yoked to you. And that we follow you wherever you lead. Oh, Lord, that's our heart. Follow you wherever you lead. And help us be gentle with one another. Help us to be meek, lowly in our hearts. Thank you, Father. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. And heal me. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. And I'll place my feet upon the rock 
Amen, Lord. I'll put a new song in my heart, in my heart. Oh, Lord, have mercy. your love and your grace protect me oh Lord let your ways and your truth direct me Place my feet upon the rock Or put a new song in my heart In my heart Oh Lord Have mercy God, we do. We count on your mercy, your mercy and your grace. For from that, we have peace with you. We have peace with God. We have peace with you. Let us have peace with one another. Help us to walk in love with you and love with our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. God bless.